Hi folks, I'm Rob McGregor from uh, Institute of Urban Ecology and welcome to today's uh, video. Uh, we're uh, doing another one in our series called Coastal Temperate Rainforest and you can see we're in the Coastal Temperate Rainforest right here in Hoi Creek area over in Coquitlam, BC. And what we're going to talk about today is something a bit different. We've been talking a lot about plants in the Coastal Temperate Rainforest. Today we're going to talk about insects and we're going to talk about ground beetles and uh, their uh, contribution to the ecology of these kind of uh, coastal temperate rainforests. Well, here's a few of the amazing beetle species that we're going to be looking at today. We're going to learn a lot about beetles in urban forests. So let's get started. Well, we're going to start here. What, what we see here is uh, two photographs of the Hoy Creek watershed in Coquitlam, one from the 1980s and one from the 1990s. Um, the one on the left, you can see there's a lot more forested land in, in the photo, and the one on the right, uh, urbanization has uh, moved into those forested areas and uh, broken them down, fragmented them, and removed some of them. So this is having an ecological effect. So in urban forests, the, one of the biggest um, effects of human uh, settlement on urban forests is loss of habitat and fragmentation of habitat. And by fragmentation, I mean breaking up of habitat into smaller and smaller pieces. So what I'm interested in, in a large sense, uh, in the Institute of Urban Ecology is how urbanization affects how uh, urban forests function in the ecological sense. Do they function the same as large pieces of forest when they're in small fragments that are dispersed from each other? And you can see, if you look at a, a photo of uh, the Coquitlam area, you can see there are a lot of forested areas in a variety of different places. There's large parks and small parks, and there's lots of parkland running along streams and rivers throughout Coquitlam. But uh, it's surrounded by uh, a matrix of other kinds of land uses, like industrial land use. You can see some gravel pits up in this part of the figure, and lots of urbanization. And the way we've been studying uh, ecological effects of urbanization in the city is by looking at ground beetles. Uh, you can see some ground beetles here on the right. You may have seen some of them in your, in your, in your garden or in your backyard. They come from the family Carabidae, which is a huge family. It's got 40,000 species in it worldwide. There's something like 3,000 species here in North America. And these insects are predominantly generalist predators. What I mean by that is uh, insects that feed on a small invertebrates, like smaller insects and various other creatures in the forest. Um, most parts of, of the world that are urbanized have a mixture of native species from the area and species that have been introduced into the area from different continents. And that's the same pattern we see in Coquitlam. Ground beetles have been used by a lot of people as indicators of ecosystem health. And we'll get into how that works as we go through this video today. But they've been used by people who work in the forestry field, in agriculture, and also in people that do studies of the effects of urbanization on ecological function. And the way you sample for ground beetles is fairly simple. We use what are called pitfall traps. And here's a diagram of a pitfall trap where you see an insect walking along the surface of the soil. And when the insect reaches this uh, cup or jar or some other vessel that's been sunk into the soil, they simply fall in and can't get back out. Here's the type of pitfall trap we use on the right, which is uh, made out of a plastic cup. So uh, pitfall traps uh, at Institute of Urban Ecology, this is how we make them. It's very simple. You can make these at home yourself. We just get two plastic beverage cups like this. One's to hold the, the hole in place after you dig the hole. And the other one is the trap that you put in for uh, insects like beetles to fall into. And then you can take the first piece out and without disturbing the hole you've made in the ground. And what we do is we screen the bottoms. I don't know if you can see, but there's a little piece of screening on the first cup. And on the second cup, there's a hole. And these both allow water to drain through the, the trap if it happens to be really rainy. If you're doing this and it's not raining, you don't need this. You can actually just put a single trap cup into the ground and that works fine as well if you want to try doing this kind of trapping on your own. So we're going to show you how to install one of these traps right now. And we'll just go over this way. Okay. 
Okay, so we're going to install our pitfall trap now in a hole. I've already dug the hole just to make it a little bit easier here. But you dig a hole such that the trap goes into the hole and the top of the trap is just at, at the top of the surface of the soil. If it's not quite right and it's sticking up a bit, you can pack the soil a little bit around it. And you don't have to do this, but what we do when we install our traps for our projects is we take a styrofoam plate like this and we cover the trap and put wooden skewers into the ground just to protect it from rain a little bit. You don't want that to be covering the top of the trap, of course, but an inch or so off of the ground. And then in, in the evening, uh, these beetles that forage at night will walk around and they'll fall into the trap and they'll be captured because apparently uh, their feet don't work so well on plastic cups, so they're trapped. We don't use a killing fluid in our traps, we just do them live and then we can identify and count them and release them on site without killing any beetles, okay? So here's a view of the Coquitlam campus of uh, Douglas College from the air. And uh, there's two areas here I want to point out that uh, we've used over the years for sampling ground beetles using the pitfall traps that we just learned about. Here is uh, an area that's part of the Hoy Creek watershed here, where Hoy Creek runs by the campus in an area that's uh, dominated by uh, coastal temperate rainforest habitat. South of the campus is an area here, this lighter green area that is uh, a meadow vegetation area that's uh, the remnants of a, a former gravel pit and a variety of other human-related disturbances. So it has quite different vegetation and habitat associated. When we sample these two areas, uh, we get a collection of uh, different beetle species. Again, as I said before, a mixture of uh, European introduced species and native species. On the left, um, a number of the species are European imports, Carabus nemoralis, Caravus granulatus, Terosticus melanarius, and Calathus fusipes are all European imports uh, that we find in our traps. And on the right, there's two species that are native forest-dwelling, slug-eating, or snail-eating species in the genus Scaphinotus. We have Scaphinotus angusticolus at the top and Scaphinotus marginatus below. Those are the native species that we see predominantly. And what we've noticed over the years is that when we collect data on uh, these, these beetles in these two habitats using pitfall traps, we find the same pattern every time. European species predominate in a disturbed meadow habitat. Yeah, so in the habitat south of the campus, we always see more European species and native forest species like those Scaphinotus species that feed on snails and slugs predominate in the forest habitat. And this pattern uh, allows us to use this as a way to detect human disturbance across different kinds of habitats in Coquitlam. So uh, when we're thinking about ground beetle diversity in urban forests, at least in Coquitlam, what we've found is that European beetle species are indicators for human disturbance. In other words, if you find one of these species, like Terosticus melanarius or Carabus nemoralis in your trap, it's a good indication that humans have had uh, an effect and probably a negative effect on the environment that you're in. So that's some of the work we've done over the years in a couple of different habitats. This is actually the second habitat we've worked in here near the Coquitlam campus of Douglas College. And this is a kind of a, a meadow that resulted after a construction project in this area many years ago. Um, you see in the, in the foreground here, uh, Scotch broom, which is an invasive weed, and Himalayan blackberry, which is also invasive. This is obviously a habitat much, much more affected by humans than the temperate rainforest we just saw a few minutes ago. And here we've got a trap uh, installed here for beetles as well. And as uh, I said before, we get a different mix of beetles in this kind of habitat compared to the temperate rainforest habitat. We get more European species there. And while we're on that, uh, what's coming up next is uh, a little discussion of a new beetle. So in 2018, right in this area, we found a beetle species that hadn't been recorded in Western Canada before in history. And it has spread north from Oregon where it was introduced uh, in around 2007 or so. And it's made its way north until it's now really well established here in Coquitlam. So we're going to hear a bit more about that now. Okay, this is the, the new beetle species I was talking about, Nebria brevicolis. 
And this is a species that's very common in Europe, possibly the most common uh, ground beetle species in Europe, but not something that normally occurs in North America. There was a couple of records of this species in eastern Canada from the 1930s, but uh, those are the only records in the Americas of that species up until about 2007 when it was found by my colleague Jim Labonte uh, down in Oregon. Uh, so as we've now found it in Coquitlam, this is a new species in Western Canada. It's spread north from Oregon, and I assume it's spreading south as well. This species is fairly invasive. Uh, most European beetles, uh, and most of the ones I've talked about already today, are mostly restricted to human-affected areas. This beetle, in Oregon at least, has a very wide range of habitats. And one other thing about it is it has functional wings, where some of the other beetle species don't, and it can disperse from area to area by flight. So here is a, a quote from a paper on this species that gives a range, the range of habitats that it occupies. And you can see it's very um, wide, if you like. Highly degraded, heavy industrial sites, agricultural fields, city parks, gardens, second growth woodlands, mature conifer forests, montane rock gardens, and otherwise pristine stands of old growth noble fir with elevations from sea level to 1,249 meters. In other words, this beetle has a lot of potential to spread into lots of different habitats here in the Vancouver area if it gets well established. And the question about a species like this is, what is really the threat of this species? This species is uh, not going to become a pest of agriculture because it doesn't feed on plants, but it might have ecological effects, things like displacement of native species if it establishes here. So we've been looking around, uh, checking around in Coquitlam. Last fall we did some sampling. Uh, our first collections of this beetle were in 2018. Uh, and we know now there was a, an introduction into Vancouver earlier than that because there's one specimen from back in 2015. But we uh, looked around in a variety of places, eight locations in Coquitlam. We trapped in the same places I've been talking about today, the David Lamb Campus Meadow and Forest Habitats, and six Coquitlam parks. And uh, what we found last fall is that it was established in four different locations in Coquitlam. So it's, it's definitely well established in Coquitlam. And what we want to do now is to find out where this beetle occurs across the Metro Vancouver area. And uh, this fall we're going to establish something called the Beetle Watch Program. We want to know where the beetle is found across the city, essentially. And we want uh, to have your help in making this happen. We're establishing a citizen science program where people from the public can get involved and they can put in pitfall traps in their own uh, parkland habitat, in their own yards and gardens. And when they capture beetles that resemble this beetle in the photo on the right, they can take photos and send it to us where we can confirm identification and we can start making a regional map of where this beetle occurs. So I hope uh, all of you want to get involved in our new Beetle Watch program this fall. We're starting it in the fall because Nebria brevicolis, the new beetle that's shown up in the Vancouver area since 2015, goes through a summer dormancy in July and August and you can't see the adults. But if we do pitfall trapping together in the fall and you take photographs, we can confirm where this beetle exists in different parts of the city. And that would be really cool to find out because right now we don't know. Well, I hope you've enjoyed learning about ground beetles today. Uh, watch our YouTube channel for more videos about beetles and lots of other things related to urban ecology. And uh, keep watch for the uh, upcoming video on the Beetle Watch program that has more details. And before we go today, I just wanted to give you my contact information. There's my email address if you have questions of any type about urban ecology or about the video today or about insects in general, just send me a message and I'll, I'll get back to you. I wanted to, uh, to uh, thank Henri Goulet and Dave Rayworth of Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada for uh, the use of uh, all of the beautiful beetle photographs you saw today. And we also received financial support for this project through the Toronto Dominion Bank, uh, TD Friends of the Environment Foundation, and also through uh, Douglas College Research and Innovation Office. Finally, I wanted to thank my daughter, Nia Davis McGregor, for, for doing the video clips that you saw in the, in the uh, presentation today. Thanks a lot for listening, and uh, we'll see you next time.